No glory, God is what our hearts long for, to be overcome by your presence, Come to me, all who are weary, all who are downtrodden. I think most of us have heard that this week. If you are here joining us for worship this morning, we welcome you and we welcome every heart that is weary, every mind that is downtrodden. God has called you to this moment because God is speaking into this moment. Welcome to worship at First United Methodist Church here in Winfield, Kansas. I'm Pastor Rochelle, and we're so glad to have you join us to hear what God has to say to our hearts and to our minds during this very moment in time. Let us worship. Our scripture reading this morning comes from John chapter 1, verses 43 through 51. The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. There he met Philip, who was from Bethsaida, the hometown of Andrew and Peter. And Jesus said to Philip, come with me. Philip then found Nathanael and said, we have found the one that Moses and the prophets wrote about. He is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael asked, can anything good come from Nazareth? And Philip answered, come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said, here is a true descendant of our ancestor Israel. And isn't, he isn't deceitful. Well, how do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, before Philip called you, I saw you under the fig tree. Nathanael said, Rabbi, you are the Son of God and the King of Israel. Jesus answered, did you believe me just because I said I saw you under the fig tree? You will see something even greater. I tell you for certain that you will see heaven open and angels going up and down on the Son of Man. I'm sure, like many of you, I'm sure, like many of you, um, We've all watched this crazy week that has unfolded. I know I have, and it has struck me to my core. And so I have spent a lot of time this week just lifting my hands up, praying to God, trying to seek out some solace, some answers, some direction, because I don't know about you, but I'm really tired of having to say again and again, these are unprecedented times. This is something that no one living has ever gone through before. How many times have we said that or felt that or cried that in the past year? Well, I want you to know that as Christians, we've bought into a whole bunch of lies. And so we're going to look at those and hear what God's truth has to say to us. Because I'm sure that um, 
there's quite a few of us that have been wondering, amidst all that is going on in the world, amidst all that's going on in our homes and our lives, our schools, our work, our lack of work, Christians, followers of Christ, we're left asking ourselves, how do we respond to this? I, I'm not really sure what the proper Christian response is supposed to be. Because one of the great lies that a lot of us have really bought into is that there's nothing we can do. We throw up our hands and say, God, your kingdom come. Tell me you haven't said that this week. Jesus, come back now. I know I have. Or we've also bought into the lie that what God has provided for us to show us how to love him and others, that it is insufficient. We hear in God's word that we're to trust. And so we trust in God, but we also kind of hedge our bets, right? We hear in scripture that we should have faith. And we do to an extent until we start to decide, well, maybe I'm having faith in the wrong thing. Even though scripture tells us to fear not, that God spoke and God, God sent messengers to teach us and tell us and to remind us that we are not to be afraid. Yeah, that sounds good. But do we really? Do we really release our fears to God? Well, today I am speaking directly to those of you who call yourself a follower of Christ. God love you if you are joining us and you're not really sure where you stand or sit on this whole Jesus thing. We welcome you and please feel free to listen, but today's message is for each and every person that calls Christ their Lord and yet feels like there's nothing we can do. That it's just time to throw up our hands and, and say, okay, have your way, God. I'm checking out. Today, we're going to look and see what God has to say to us because we are reminded and we do believe in the sufficiency of scripture. Everything we need is here. Everything we need is here and here. His kingdom here now. And so we're going to look at what our Christian responsibility is in the midst of a global pandemic, in the midst of a national political crisis, in the midst of chaos that we could have never imagined seeing in our lifetime. We're going to pose the question, what is our Christian responsibility? Not only what can we do, but what should we do? What is God calling us to do? My favorite modern-day um, theologian, N.T. Wright, has a lot to say about this. He's um, one of my favorites. I have his rookie card at home. I'll show it to you if you ever ask. But N.T. Wright wrote a book kind of straight out the gate last spring about the Christian responsibility, the Christian response to a global pandemic, because this isn't the first time this has happened. We're reminded how hospitals and hospices came to be through the hands and feet, the working hearts and the courage of Christians around the world to speak Jesus into moments of fear and pandemic and plague. And so N.T. Wright in his book, um, God and the Pandemic, he writes that our very first vital initial response is to embrace lament. That's something we as Christians aren't really sure that we should embrace, right? We, we recognize it as part of the human condition. We're all going to lament. We're all going to have passionate expressions of grief and sorrow from time to time. But are we to embrace it? Well, N.T. Wright, he says, yes, we are to embrace it. He reminds us that our psalms in scripture, about a third of them are all about lamenting. They're all written with words of complaining, 
sometimes questioning. These psalms of lament, the writers are pouring out words of sorrow and anger, frustration, and quite often, bitterness. Now this book, the book of Psalms, it's all part of the prayer book that Jesus himself used. We hear the voices crying out to God in sorrow, and we are reminded how Jesus, he spoke straight from that playbook himself. We saw Jesus lament. We saw him cry. We saw him weep at the death of his dear friend Lazarus, the brother of Mary and Martha, who lived just right outside of Jerusalem, were reminded that Jesus met them in their grief. He embraced lament himself personally. We're reminded how Jesus on the cross, he lamented, he expressed great sorrow. He was quoting his hymn book from the Psalms as he cried out to his God in grief and wonder, sorrow. So we see Christ setting this example of embracing lament, that it's not only okay to lament to God, but that we should. Christ modeled that for us. But we're also reminded that that is the vital initial response. We don't stay there. We may circle back around to it time and time again, but we move from that and we're spurred. We see God moving us and reminding us that he joins us in our grief. He knows intimately how we feel. He knows our fears. He knows our sorrows. And this is exactly what the world needs to see from us followers of Christ right now. Where our lament should lead us, where our response should be, causes us to pose this question that N.T. Wright spells out, and I, I love the way he says this. He poses the question, what might it mean to say, as Jesus was to Israel, so the church should be for the world? What Jesus was to those chosen people, the descendants of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, what he was to them, we are to be for the world. And what is that? We are to be a light shining. We are to be a reminder of the presence of God living among us. Now, if the earliest disciples found Jesus coming to meet them in their tears, their fears, their doubt, even behind locked doors in an upper room, perhaps the world today can also find their God coming to meet them behind closed doors, seclusion, in grief, in fear, in uncertainty. Because I think we can all recognize right now that the world needs Jesus. Have you thought about that this week as you've watched the news? Just without any other words that can form in your mouth. All I know is the world needs Jesus. And us as followers of Christ, we're going to bring it to them. We are going to bring Christ to the world. It's what we've been called to do time and time again since the beginning, since Christ first came. That has always been the response of every follower of Christ in every situation. But not, but I think right now, even more so. And we start at the beginning. We start by remembering that God wanted us to know how. We wanted us to know how we can bring Jesus to the people. And he would never call us to do anything without explaining how. And in his word, throughout the gospels, throughout the life of Christ and his disciples and the apostles that followed after, he showed us time and time again how, exactly how, we can bring Jesus into this world, this world that so desperately needs him. And I love that 
story after story in our Bible spells this out to us, but doesn't just spell it out. It, it's clear because there's a common denominator amongst every story of Jesus being introduced to people who had not known him before. We, we see that Jesus, when he comes and he meets with people in scripture, these stories that have been kept for us throughout the centuries, we see that Jesus, he doesn't use persuasion to get people to come and know him, but he always uses invitation. And the disciples do the same thing. Come and see, come and check it out for yourself. Our scripture teaches that followers, followers of Christ are to have a role in introducing Christ to the world. That we are called, each and every one of us, whether we have been attending church since we were knee-high to a grasshopper, or we just crossed the path of a church for the first time yesterday, each of us are called, are commanded by God to introduce others to Christ. And so in today's scripture, we heard um, Clyde tell us about one of those early stories of how some of the first disciples came and came to know Jesus. We hear this story of how God made himself known to others, and he made himself known as a God who knows us. Not just in some abstract way, but God himself as Jesus revealed that he knows each and every one of us in very personal, very specific ways. We see this in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 35. This is the passage that just immediately preceded the passage that Clyde read earlier. In it, we see John the Baptist, where he typically is, along the Jordan River, baptizing. And the author of this Gospel, John, he writes, the next day, John the Baptist was there again with two of his students, two of his disciples. And when he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. He pointed him out. And when the two disciples of John the Baptist, John the Baptizer, when they heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? Jesus to them, to Jesus, they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and they saw where he was staying and they spent the day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, which is Simon Peter's brother, was one of these two disciples. And he heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and to tell him, we have found the Messiah. We have found the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated means Peter. Jesus finds these disciples, these fishermen, when he found Philip, he said, follow me. He invited him. And when Philip found Nathaniel, he said, we found the one that Moses wrote about, the one the prophets have been talking about for hundreds of years, this Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. And Philip who had heard from Andrew and from John and from Peter, Philip goes and he tells Nathaniel. Because we tell our friends exciting news, right? And with our good friends, we can anticipate their reactions. Philip probably knew just exactly how Nathaniel would respond. I mean, we all have that one snarky friend, right? Maybe we are the one snarky friend. 
But Philip chooses to tell Nathaniel anyway. And regardless of whatever reaction he was going to have, he was going to tell him about who he had met. And of course, Nathaniel says, well, could anything good come from Nazareth? And Philip, he could have responded by giving him his opinion. He could have said, you know, this Jesus guy, he's like the world champion at Bible trivia. He's amazing. He could have said, there's just something about this guy. There's something that just draws you to him. It's like he has this magnetic personality. And even when Nathaniel expresses skepticism about anything from Nazareth, Philip, he could have listed a who's who of successful people that have actually come out of Nazareth, but instead, Philip simply says, come and see. And I believe that ever since, Christians, as, as followers of Christ, we have struggled with sharing the good news. We have struggled to introduce people to Jesus because we've constantly felt like we needed to prove the truth of the Christian faith. I believe it's where the body of Christ has struggled for so long. But never in my experience have I ever seen anyone debated into belief in Christ. But I have seen people invited to come and see come check it out. And it's the same thing we see in scripture time and time again. People coming to know Christ simply by being introduced. Philip didn't try to prove anything to his buddy Nathaniel. He didn't give him a dissertation or a five-point plan as to what would happen and, and proving who he was. But he invited him to come and see. And in this invitation, Philip is using the same method Christ himself used just the day before when he invited Andrew and that other disciple to come, come and see, spend the day with me, come see where I'm staying. And then they invited Andrew's brother, Simon, who would become Peter, the great apostle, to come and see. And so what happens? as a result of this invitation to come and see. It's one of the most liberating biblical insights regarding sharing the news of Christ. It's that invitation paves the way to revelation. Philip invites, Nathaniel accepts, and Jesus reveals. In verse 47, Jesus reveals that he knows him. He knows exactly who Nathaniel is. He's revealing that he is the son of God and that God knows exactly who he is. He knows us. He knows our fears. He knows our anxieties. He knows the shame. He knows what we hold on to in our hearts. And not only does he know us, but he joins us in all of it. When Jesus was revealed, then Nathaniel believed. And through a simple invitation to come check it out, a path was paved for Christ to be revealed. And oh, what a revelation. At times, Jesus admonishes people for only believing because of what they've seen. And usually folks that should have known better. Folks who, should, folks who had already met and known Christ. But here in this initial meeting, when Nathaniel meets Christ, Nathaniel's skepticism, it's not condemned. It's not admonished. In fact, Jesus praises him and instead declares, you ain't seen nothing yet. Stick with me, kid. Stick with me and you're going to see where heaven and earth come together, where they will be connected through me, through my life. And you're going to experience that. Invitation paves the way to revelation. When someone accepts our invitation to come and see what God is doing in our church, what God is doing in our ministries, 
the way that we serve, when people come and see what's going on in our prayer groups, our Bible studies, our homes, our stories of how God worked and stepped in and was present when nobody else was. When people come and see that, when that invitation is accepted, it can lead to hearts and minds open to our God revealing himself. Revealing himself to our world. Making himself known to all of us. Revealing the knowledge that, hey, I know you. And I love you. I hear your cries. I see your fear. I recognize your anxiety. And I want you to see me. And I want you to see heaven and earth collide in a very real sense through me. How often was it this week that we would turn on the news, read the news, pull up the news, and think, God, reveal yourself in this world? Because we are screwing it up. Reveal yourself. This is our Christian response. We are going to bring Jesus. You and I, we as lovers and followers of Jesus, we are going to bring Jesus to our world through invitation. What peace and reassurance God's holy word can bring, and it does, what comfort Christ's acts provide, as we're reminded today, if we want God to be revealed in our world, in our homes, in our schools, in our workplaces, it starts with inviting people to come and see because they haven't seen nothing yet. Invite so that God may be revealed. Amen. So we have heard and we've been invited to bring Christ, to be Christ, to walk in the freedom that Paul says in Galatians is ours. And in that confidence that we might give grace and glory of God to all. Let us affirm and confirm as we join together to sing God of grace and God of glory.
Let us come together in a spirit of prayer. Please pray with me. Compassionate and loving God, hear our cries. Hear the pain in our hearts, the fear that sometimes overwhelms. Hear our anger and our frustration. Take all that is consuming our thoughts, all the injustice, all of the bitterness, all of the division, all of the fear, all of the grief. Take it, God, and give us your peace. Comfort your world, O oh God. Reveal to us each opportunity you put before us to respond like your son, Jesus Christ, to this hurting and broken world. Remind us to be kind in the face of anger. Remind us to pray for those who persecute us, those who hurt us. Help us not to judge, but to extend compassion and grace, even when we don't want to, especially when we don't want to. Enable us through your Holy Spirit to love others. God, our world needs just an outpouring of your spirit into our lives and into this world. Empower us so that we may be peacemakers. God, hear the laments of our heart. Hear our cries. Remind us in very real, tangible ways that you are present and that you are active and you are aware of each and every tragedy, crisis, personal, personal devastation that all of us are going through. Help us to see you in the midst of that. And as we are able, as you are in power, help us to share that story. Help us to invite people into our story of how you have worked within us and through us for your glory. These things we lift up. In your glorious Son, Jesus Christ's name, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So this place in which we live is without walls, is without denomination. It is a sweet, sweet place. It is the house of God. Right. 
Without a doubt we know that we will then revive when we shall leave this place. Traditionally, at the end of a time of worshiping God, a pastor or a lay person, someone will come up and give a blessing. We call it a benediction. And we often say words like, may God bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. But I want, to hear, I want you to hear that in a fresh new way as you go forward, as you go out into your lives today and into this week. May God bless you in all that you do. May God bless the work of your hands. May God bless your family. May God bless your friendships. May God keep you. May he keep you safe. May he keep you comforted. May he keep you well. And when he shines his face upon you, remember that he does so because you are his child and he is looking upon you with the glee of a father because he loves you. Regardless of what has ever been said or done or what past you may have, God loves you. You are his child. Go in peace.